Welcome, everybody. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Well, let's get the awkwardness out of the way right off the bat. Turn to somebody and say this word to them, money. money. Yeah, say it again. Say it again. Cause it might take a couple of times, cause, cause it, it, especially if you're, one of those, if you're one of those people who believe, oh, you should never talk about money in church, say it again. Turn around to somebody else. Say Go ahead, go ahead. Ready? One, two, three. Money. I know some people that get like this, that, that their jaw tightens up. You go ahead and say. You probably talked about it all day today. We are in the final part, this three-part series entitled God and Money. And God has a lot to say about money. The Bible has a ton of scriptures about money, okay? He knows that it preoccupies our minds. He knows that it sometimes is the cause of breakup of marriage. He knows sometimes that people even get physically sick over the fact of the stress that they can't pay their bills, they're gonna lose their house, can't pay my car, they're gonna come and get it. You think, what kind of father would he be if he did not care about his children's welfare as it pertains to finances? Even a natural father, even if a father has nothing to do with God, never opened up the Bible, doesn't know who Jesus is, even if every father has something, or should have something instinctively on the inside that wants to make sure that his children are taken care of. How much more our Father in heaven? Amen? Amen. We're in this series. It's the, the real foundation of this series is consecration. We've been on this subject of consecration since the beginning of the year. We're continuing this weekend. Consecration cannot truly really take place in our lives unless it's a full, complete consecration. So if you're going to consecrate, what does it mean to consecrate? If you're going to dedicate your life to God, if you're going to set yourself apart for God's use, but, but you're going to say, well, you can have my heart, you can have everything else, but don't touch my wallet. That's not true consecration. Because if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for the breath that he put in your lungs, if it wasn't for the ability that he gave you to earn a salary, you wouldn't have two cents. You wouldn't have two nickels to rub together. And everybody said? Amen. All right. So let me review a little bit here. Let me review last week. If you were not here last week, obviously it's impossible for me to review completely. I'm going to just do a little surface review, and then we're going to wrap this series up, okay? So last week, we talked about the subject of the tithe. Now, if you're not familiar with that word, tithe is an old English word that means 10. It means a tenth. It means 10%. Now, that's God's plan. It's not, I didn't come up here. I didn't design this. I didn't put this whole teaching together. You can go in the Bible, and you see all the way from the book of Genesis, all the way through into the New Testament. You see the subject of the tithe covered from Scripture to Scripture to Scripture. Okay? It is God's design. He put it together. It's his plan. Like I said last week, he put it together. He's only asking for 10%. If it was my plan, I would have went for 25%. <laughs> so, simply put, our finances are consecrated when we follow God's plan. Okay? I'm going to say it again. Your finances, my finances, our finances are consecrated when we put them under the influence of God. When we, when we take our finances... And we say, here, Father, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have anything. Everything, you, everything I have belongs to you. You let me use it while I'm here on the earth. I'm grateful for that. So in order to honor you, in order to pay respect to you, in order to, to consider myself part of your plan and part of your covenant, here at your disposal are my finances. And God, God has commanded us, and it, it appears again in Genesis, can't go through the whole teaching, go listen to the teaching from last week, just go on the media page, go to the... The, uh, go to the website, go to the media page, and you'll find that there. So what is the tithe? The tithe, God says this. If you will take the first 10% of your increase and dedicate it to me, then I will bless the other 90%. I will bless your life. I will, I will include you in my covenant. And it's not that you're buying your way into it. We are brought into covenant with God Almighty through the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross and you received him, and you believed in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, that God raised him from the dead, that he paid for your sins and paid for my sins. When we come to that conclusion and we declare with our mouth what we believe in our heart, 
we become what the Bible calls born again. Amen? So you are then brought into this covenant, this relationship. It's a restored relationship back with God Almighty through, through what? Through your good works? Through how much money you give? Of course not. Through how much prayer? How many times you sit in church? No. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. Amen? So now we're brought into this covenant. We're brought into this relationship. We are now children of God. Amen? We are members of the kingdom. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so it's, it's, just, it's just the normal thing for us to do to say, you gave everything for me. Jesus, you gave everything for me. And because you gave everything for me, I, want to, I, just, I don't want to withhold anything from you. I've, I've said this before, especially in this series. I don't know what it was. 35, it's going to be 35 years soon. In April, it'll be 35 years that I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And instinctively, nobody had to teach me. Nobody had just, it just came. I just knew on the inside that when I made that step, when I took that step and made that declaration that Jesus Christ was the Lord of my life and I would follow him the rest of my life, I knew instinctively that I cannot withhold anything from him, no matter what he would want. Just, just knew it, just had a knowing on the inside. Then I started, as I started to learn the scriptures, I started to realize, oh, this is in the Bible. He, he wants in other words, when, when he takes us, he wants all of us. Amen. Jesus didn't pay for part of you. Jesus paid for all of you, yes? yes. Okay, so we, we, real fast, let me, get, let, me get, let me get through this review because I really want to give you the next part of this teaching so that we can wrap this whole thing up. Amen? Amen. So we find the, the, the official, if you could put it this way, we find the commands pertaining to the tithe in Malachi chapter 3. Now, now, mind you now, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. The book of Malachi, written by the prophet Malachi, was written 400 years before Jesus shows up on the earth. Now, mind you now, the, the, the primary emphasis of this book is God commanding his people to return to them. Now, now, watch the mercy of God. It's so important that this book is placed where it is. Let me explain this to you. Because we know, chronologically speaking, Malachi is the very last time that a prophet speaks to the nation of Israel for 400 years. The next prophet to show up on the scene is John the Baptist. So God is, is, is in just encouraging his people, come back to me, return to me. Start to honor me again. Why? He knew there was going to be 400 years of silence. So he's making this last emphasis before this 400 years, this time of complete silence, nobody could say authentically, thus saith the Lord, until John the Baptist shows up 400 years later. 400 years, that's almost double the history of our nation. Could you imagine that? So the very last words that they had to hang on to until the next prophet shows up, the emphasis is on returning to God and, and, and getting your finances in order. Look at this, Malachi chapter 3. I'm going to read through this real quick because we'll be spending some more time on it later. God speaking through the prophet to the nation of Israel. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Bring all your 10%, he's saying to them, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, if you come to my garage, you're going to see that there's not room enough to move in there. <laughs> but I'd rather have this kind of blessing, amen? amen. Not, not, not stuff from 20 years ago and things that nobody's going to use again. Stuff that you, how many, how many save things that when you need them, you can't find them and you got to go buy them anyway? <laughs> well, picture that kind of blessing. Picture it as blessing. All right, God's saying, if you put me first and bring me your first, so that there's provision in my house, I'll put you first. Amen? And then if that wasn't a good enough promise, verse 11 backs it up. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Some of you didn't even know you have a devourer that's following you around. You have a devourer that's trying to just eat everything up on you, eat your lunch, eat your finances, destroy your family, destroy your marriage. God knows you have a devourer. He said, if you'll put me first in these things, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. 
nor shall the vine fail to bear, bear fruit for you in the field. Now, say, well, I don't have a vine, I don't have a field. Of course, this was written to an agricultural society. But today he would say, I'll rebuke the devourer, and you say, I'll protect your job. I'll protect your investment. I'll protect your children. I'll protect your household. How many know if you've got God protecting you, you can go to sleep at night? Amen? So listen, so we don't bring our tithes. Watch this now. Again, you've got to go back to last week because there's so much. There's so much I shared. We don't bring our tithes to get something from God. We bring our tithes to thank God for all that we have. For, listen, listen, listen. Please hear my heart, okay? I don't know. And maybe this is close to my heart because I, I was raised in a culture of honor. We understood honor. We understood that you, you spoke to certain people a certain way, especially if they were older than you, out of honor, out of respect. And it's unfortunate that, that this generation, and it's been a couple of generations, that has lost the concept of honor. We have no honor, we have no honor for our leaders. We have no honor for policemen. We have no, no honor for, for clergy. We have no honor for parents. We have no honor for nobody. Amen. And if you're not careful, you'll find yourself not having honor for God. And the tithe is not about the money. It's about putting him first, and it's about honoring him. You remember, we, we talked about Genesis chapter 14 and 15, where, where Abram, he's involved in a battle. He's gone to rescue his nephew Lot, who's been kidnapped. All their possessions were taken. He's got four armies that he's fighting, and 318 people he takes with him. And he defeats those kings, and on his way back from that battle, he stops by a place that the Bible refers to as the city of Salem, which eventually becomes Jerusalem, okay? And there's this priest that comes out. His name is Melchizedek. And Abraham, what does he do? He takes 10% of everything that he has, and he gives it to this priest. Why? Out of honor. Out of honor. The priest comes out and prays a blessing over Abraham. And in turn, Abraham takes his 10% of all the spoil, all that he got from this battle, and he gives it to his man. You notice he didn't give it to him first and then get the blessing. He gave it to him after the blessing. You bring your tithes. We don't bring our tithes to pay God off like we're paying off a loan shark. Are you listening to me? It's honor. If you can't bring it with honor, then don't bring it. Are, are you, are you, am I getting across? Good. Okay, so... Last week, you talked about that everything that belongs to God must carry the mark of God. When you, were, when you were born again, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that the Holy Spirit came to seal you on the inside. There's a seal. I don't know what it looks like. You don't know what it looks like. When we get to heaven, we'll find out. But it's obvious that there's a seal. Why? Because as soon as you got born again, the devil came after you. He knew. He knew that something had taken place in your life. So we're sealed. So from that, that moment on, when you said, Jesus, come into my heart, you be my Lord, be my Savior, I believe in you, bam, the Holy Spirit comes and seals you. In the Old Testament, we talked about this last week, the seal, the mark in the Old Testament that somebody belonged to God was circumcision. Okay? Circumcision. Yeah, I don't have to go into this and become real graphic about it. You know what I'm talking about. So there's no, there's no question whatsoever. God gave the command to Abram that every male should be circumcised. Why? That they would have a mark in their body that distinguished them from the rest of the people in the world. Now, the tithe is to our finances what circumcision is to the body. It's a mark. It is, it is something that's taken away. It is something that is removed. It is, it is something that's, listen, 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 because we don't like this. It's something that's missing. But that part that's missing distinguishes that these finances belong to God Almighty. Yes or no? Amen. 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 So it is up to us to honor our covenant partner, our senior partner. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled with overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. We say, well, I don't make homemade wine, and I don't have a barn. Okay, so today in our society, we'd say, honor the Lord with your wealth and the first, the first 10%, the first fruits of your increase. Then your bank accounts will be full. Then your investments will be okay. This is his promises. I didn't write this. This, this is his. Are you, are you getting this? 
These are pro- that, this promise, listen to me, don't, don't, don't treat the promises of God like a buffet. I like this. I don't like that. I want some fried chicken. I don't need salad today. This, this, this promise, listen to me, this promise is just as serious as a promise as John 3.16. John 3.16, what, what is John? Let, 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 let's repeat it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So we go, yeah, 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 I'll take that promise. I want that promise. This one we go, eh. It's a promise. So the question was asked, are your finances marked of God? Do your finances declare that you are in covenant with God? Are your finances honoring God? I I don't want you to show your hands. I don't want you to come and tell me. It's none of my business. Okay? I don't don't want to know who tithes, who doesn't tithe. I don't want to know who gives, who doesn't give. I don't want to know because I'm human just like you. I don't want to be tempted to treat one person better than another because I know this guy gave a big check, this person put 10 cents. I don't want to know. This is between you and God. Are you listening to me? Amen. Amen. So let's, let's move into this next part, okay? Now, God's plan for, for financial success involves two things. It involves tithes and it involves offerings. Now, let me read, let me read Malachi chapter 3 again. And see if you catch this, okay? Malachi chapter 3, starting before, in verse 7, as opposed to what I read before, God speaking to Israel, ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Verse 8, God speaking, will a mortal, will, will, will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes, and say it with me, and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Then he goes into verse 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. So you see the rebuke. You see what God is trying to get. He's trying to position them. Listen to me. Because if your finances are not in order, how many have ever had a period in your life uh, where your finances have been out of order? Just, just a few. The rest of you, yeah. Okay. How, let's do it again. How many, of you, how many of you have had times in your life where your finances were completely out of order? Does it not affect every other area of your life? Yes. So God says, look, before I go quiet on you to the nation of Israel, before I am silent, I want to make sure you get these things right because you're going to need, watch this, He's talking to the nation of Israel. You're going to need to survive 400 years without hearing from me. And the last thing you need is your finances out of order during that time period. Whenever God starts dealing with you, and I know we've been hearing the report since this series has started. Whenever God starts dealing with you about getting your finances in order, you need to listen. Why? Because he knows what's coming. He knows what's up ahead. You don't see it, but he knows what's around the corner. And he knows, man, they're going to have to go through this rough time. I want to make sure that they're financially in position to make sure if God's dealing with you to get your credit cards paid off, dear God, pay them off. If God's dealing with you about not making a purchase, don't make the purchase. Are you listening? If God's dealing with you, he wants you to go and help somebody. If he puts it on your heart, you know, and and listen, give God the opportunity to work in your life. Some people, no, I can't do that, I can't. How do you know what you could do? If God's asking you to do something, do you think he knows better than you whether you could do it or not? So let him speak to you. Maybe God wants you to make a car payment for somebody who's having a rough deal right now. Just, oh God, I can't do it, I can't. How do you know you can't do it? Give him something to work with. You'll see the blessing that'll come back in your life. Amen? Amen? So, it's tithes and offering. That's God's plan. So, let's go. I want to go to this, because I can't think of a better place to teach from, as it pertains to the subject of offerings, than 2 Corinthians chapter 9, okay? Now, while you're, while you're go, if you're going on your phone, you've got your Bible, you're going to look at the screen, some of the most comprehensive teachings on the subject of offerings are found in the letter that Paul wrote 
to the church that was made up mostly of Gentile, non-Jewish believers. And that's the church of Corinth. I was reading after this, studying after this, I came across one Bible commentator, listen to what this Bible commentator said about the ancient times, about the time that Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth. This is what he said. The pagans gave their bodies to everyone, but their money to no one. It was not in the culture of Rome to be generous to anybody. It was not in the Greek culture to be generous to anybody, none. You remember, you might remember this because you know you're all students of the Bible and students of history. The Greeks were the people that used to take babies if they had any idea that a child was lacking or deficient or deformed, they'd leave him in the woods. They'd put him on a rock someplace on a mountain and just let the child die. No sense of hospitality, of no sense of generosity, no sense of helping one another. That's what blew their minds when the Christians came along. Let me read you the rest of this quote. The pagans gave their bodies to everyone but their money to no one. The Christians gave their bodies to no one but gave their money to everyone. Yeah, you got quiet because most of our culture today lives like the pagans did 2,000 years ago. Bodies to everybody. Here, come and get what you want. Excuse me, I'm not trying to be nasty tonight. Hooking up with this one, hooking up with the other one. You want me to give my money? No. That's my money. Yeah, say ouch. So, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, Paul addresses an issue about making a collection, taking a collection for the Christians that lived in Jerusalem at that time. They were suffering from persecution. There was a famine that hit that area. And so Paul is making this his, his responsibility to take up a collection, take up an offering to help the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, it must have been some offering because by this point in history, there's probably over a million Christians in that area. You remember... Just on the day of Pentecost, you had 3,000 get saved. Then a couple days later, 5,000 get saved. It just it swept across that area. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now I'm going to read through this, and I'm going to go back, and then we're going to take our time because I want you to see, look at me, look at me. I want you to see the mechanics of biblical giving. It is very different than what most people practice. Okay, here we go. Verse 6, the Apostle Paul writing to the church of Corinth. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Verse 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a what? Cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work Verse 9, as it is written. Now watch. When you see as it is written in the New Testament, it's quoting the Old Testament, okay? They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, look at verse 10. Now, he who supplies, now that, that he should really be capitalized. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed, your store of seed. Of seed. You catching this? We shouldn't have just a couple of seeds in our pocket. We should, we should have a store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Now, let's look at this. This is the point that I want to make in this teaching. The differences between the tithe and the offerings, okay? And th there is a difference. We're going to see it. It's very clear, very clear. So, so, so when you, after, after this teaching, I'm going to ask you to please pay attention how you're giving, okay? Uh, whether it's a tithe or whether it's an offering, okay? Say, so, well, what I have to be, so you'll see. You'll see what I'm talking about, okay? The tithe, number one, number one point, the tithe is giving back to God that which is already his, are you catching this? When we, when we bring our tithes, some people, some people like to use the terminology, when we pay our tithes, okay? When we pay our tithes, when we bring our tithes, what we're doing is we are only giving back to God what's already his. Yes or no? Yes. Turn around somebody and say, it's his. Yes. We give him 10%, we have 90% left for our needs. That's not a bad deal. 
So out of that 90%, we, we can take care of our families. We, we're supposed to save for our future. We're supposed to leave an inheritance Amen. for our children, our children's children. Amen. Okay? All right? Uh, we're supposed to also invest in the work of spreading the gospel. We're supposed to also invest in, in feeding the poor, caring for those in need. Oh, and you're saying, how am I going to do that? You're not the only one. Could you imagine, could you imagine just our church, if every single person just tithes, forget about the offerings, just tithe, there wouldn't be a homeless person around. There wouldn't be a person out in the street. There wouldn't be a person that lacked clothing. There wouldn't be a person that needed a car that couldn't, couldn't have a car. There wouldn't be a person that had a car. There wouldn't be a single mom that had a car broke down and she can't get it fixed because she don't have the money. Why? Because the church of Jesus Christ would be so empowered that we'd be able to take care of all these things. We're the ones that are supposed to be doing this. Don't you understand this? The people who complain about the government, complain about the government, complain about the government, waste so much money. Of course they waste money. They're not anointed for these things. We are. The church is supposed to be doing this work. The government's got no business feeding the poor. Government's got no business taking care of the home. So they're, they're taking my taxes. That's not what it's supposed to go for. We're supposed to be doing it. The church is supposed to be doing it. Why do you think there's such a blessing on this church? Why do you think there's such a blessing on this ministry? We've been feeding the poor in this community since, since 2006. Sometimes seven, 800 families a month, up to 1,400 families a month. Up until just recently, up to 1,400 families a month. Are you listening? So, the offerings are supposed to come. The tithe is God's. Amen? Offerings are supposed to come out of our 90%. Oh, it got quiet. <laughs> Number two, difference now. We're talking about difference between tithe and offering. The tithe is commanded. God directs us to set aside the first 10%. He already establishes how much it's supposed to be. Yes or no? Yes. And it's commanded of God, right? Yes. Well, with the offering, verse 7 said, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart. You see the difference? He leaves it up to us. Now, uh, he, he goes on to say, each should, each should give what you decide in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a chill forgiver. Our, when we bring, when we take the offering, it should be the most joyous time of the service. Why? Because this is the time we're actually putting some action to what we claim. We claim that we love God. We claim that we're grateful. We claim that we want to thank him for what we have. Well, what's the best way to do it? Here. Here, God, Father, I'm bringing this to you. Here's my tithe. Here's my offerings. The tithe is to honor you. My offerings are to invest into the kingdom. That should be a joyous time. We should come cheerfully. Why? Because if you only knew what you were setting into motion by being obedient to these principles, you'd be dancing all over the church. We'll get there. Now, in giving offerings, now remember, the tithe, we're commanded how much you give, and it's got to be first. But in offerings, we have permission from God to decide with our own heart how much it's going to be. Now, now, obviously, we should be consulting the Holy Spirit. I tell you, my wife and I have something worked out. And it's, been, it's been working like this for 35 years now. When we, we'll both know when God's dealing with us to bless somebody or to give a specific amount or to, to invest into a project that has something to do with the gospel or to support a ministry or, or to just bless someone, especially when it's to bless someone. And I'll just look at her and I'll go, you know what the number is, right? And she'll go, yeah. And I'll say, what is it? And she'll say the number, and we'll be total agreement, total agreement. Why? We're husband and wife. Okay? Now, now if, you're, if you're single, divorced, widowed, whatever it is, you, you, you are partnered with God. His Holy Spirit lives inside you. Don't you think he can tell you how much he wants you to give? And then, and then don't get a stomachache. Some people, as soon as you mention giving, their stomach goes, Ehr. don't get like that. Don't get like that, because you have to look at it this way. God has placed a certain amount of money in his account in your name. Amen. You catching this? Yes. It's his, but he put it in your name. You listening? Mm -hmm. He put it in your name. Now, if he wants to take money out of his account that's in your name and put it in somebody else's account that's in his, their name, what business is that of yours? That's right. You go like this. How much you want? What do you want me to move, Father? Don't look at it like it's leaving you. Look at it as if you're transferring funds out of your account into somebody else's account, but it's all God's. 
Are you catching this? See, you, you, if you let this sink in, you'll have such freedom when it comes to giving. Such freedom. We'll get there. Number three, tithing is not seed. Okay? Because it's a mark of the covenant. The purpose of the tithe is not a seed. The purpose of the tithe is to identify who do these finances belong to. You catching this? This is awesome truth here. And when you start operating the truth of these things, you start giving efficiently. You start giving effectively. You start having an attitude of faith when you do these things. So, offerings are seed. Why? Because it said it just in that scripture that we read. Verse 10, now he, God, who supplies what? Are we in a different translation? Let's start again. Now he who supplies what? Thank you. That's where I was going. Now he who supplies what? Seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest. Now, tithing really doesn't have a harvest. Tithing serves to identify these finances are marked of God. Tithing exists to, it's like, it's like your card when you go to Costco. That card is not an investment. That card identifies you as having specific benefits that when you walk through that door, you're going to pay the price that's marked on there. They're not going to charge you with surcharge because you don't belong. You getting this? I'm going to keep going. Okay. So again, tithing is not seed. Offerings are seed. Number four. In the tithe, this is an important one. In the tithe, God determines the blessing. Remember he said, I will open up the window of heaven and pour out a blessing. Watch this now. In the offering, we decide how much the blessing is going to be. So that that sounds like a blasphemous statement because you don't know the scripture. I'll read it to you. Remember, God said, I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. Yes or no? So he determines the blessing over the time. But you know who determines the increase? You know who determines the level of blessing in return? We do. Verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember this. Whoever sows what? Sparingly will also reap sparingly. Let's put it this way. Whoever sows sparingly is also going to reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap what? So who, who determines what you're going to sell? You do. Who determines the level of blessing that you're going to receive? You do. Are you catching this? Now, now, let me clarify this a little bit. Let me bring some balance here, okay? Don't go out of here saying, well, I'm going to go borrow $10,000 from somebody because if I give $10,000, maybe I'm going to get $100,000 back. It doesn't work that way, sweetheart. God's not a slot machine. Are you catching this? Okay? It's the attitude of the heart. You're, you, you may remember, if you listen to the, to the teaching from last week, you might remember me sharing a story. When my wife and I were in business many years ago here in town, local area, you know, we did very well at some point. And at that point in time, at that point in time, it, it was nothing. I'm not bragging, just use an illustration, not bragging. It'd be nothing to grab $2,000 and throw it in an offering. I'm talking 30 years ago. $2,000 was money 30 years ago. Okay, But I noticed that when we went into bankruptcy, we lost everything. God walked us through that process. God protected us. God restored us. But you know what? I noticed that the $10, the $20, the $100 that we gave during that season seemed like it had way more blessing on it than the $2,000 that was given an increase. Because that $2,000 came out of extra. Are you listening to me? So who determines the blessing? We do. Now, it would have been easy for us, and some of you might say you would have been justified to stop your giving when you were in those tough times. I remember what it was like. Many of you have heard me talk about those times. Uh, We didn't know what a loaf of bread was unless it had a black mark on it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Leftover bread, leftover cakes, leftover Twinkies. How bad can leftover Twinkies be? They last for 100 years. You know what I'm saying? 
family would come by the house, come to visit. They'd leave half an hour after they left, they'd call up and go, go to such and such a place, I put $100 behind here. That's how bad it was. Go to such and such a place. They'd come over, they'd bring bags of food, all kinds of, we know what it's like to go through those times. But you wanna know something? I'm so grateful that we never stopped tithing. Whether the tithe was $100, whether the tithe was $10, no matter what it was, I'm so grateful that we never stopped tithing. Because we understood no matter how tough things get, we're gonna honor God, we're gonna continue to honor God. Because let me tell you something, when you're in that kind of situation, that's the only way you're gonna get out of it. If you shut down your giving because you're in a tough time, guess what? You, that's, like, that's like pulling the plug on your oxygen tank. That's your lifeline to get out of that trouble. Why? Because it's seed. It's seed. It's seed. What's, what, oh my gosh, what sense does it make for a farmer to say, I don't have any food. I better not plant this seed. I better hold on to it. How are you going to eat next year? You can't eat the seeds. I mean, you could, but what, what good are they going to do? But that farmer says, oh, no, I know this is a tough season I'm going through right now. We might have to eat bread and water, okay? We might have to eat pancakes for dinner. But you know what? We're going to turn this season around. Why? Because you keep tithing. You keep honoring God. You keep blessing him. Because exactly, you be doing exactly what the enemy wants you to do. Cut off your line of blessing. Cut off, your, 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 cut off the vehicle of blessing. Cut off the pipeline. Don't do that. So, Number four, the difference between the tithe and the offering, God determines a blessing, but in the offering, we decide the level of blessing. Number five, the, in the tithe, nations call us blessed. That's what it says. It says when you pay the tithe, you bring your tithes, I'm going to pour out a blessing that you can't even receive, and then it goes on to how rebuke the devour for your behalf, and you'll be blessed, and then all the nations will call you blessed and call you a delightful land, Okay? But watch this now. In the offerings, God gets the praise. God receives thanksgiving. Watch this. Verse 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Did you ever have an occasion? I'm sure many of us in this room have had that occasion. Have you ever had an occasion where God has used you to bless someone? And what's the first thing they should say? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Right. Yes or no? Thank you, God. Thank you, God. That's what we, we want our generosity not to reflect, you know, I hate to go into this, but how many of you have relatives that when they, when they do something for you, they never let you forget about it? Come on, let me see your hands. I don't want to be the only one standing. Let me see your hands. Yeah, they do something for you, and then 10 years later, you remember when? We don't want that. When we're generous, when we give, when we bless somebody, we, we want to do it. No strings attached so that the blessing, so that the thanksgiving goes where? To God. Big difference between tithes and offerings here. So, now, let me bring some, again, some balance here. I want to bring you back to verse 10. We're, we're wrapping this up soon. Now, verse 10 says, now he who supplies seed to the who? Sower. sower. So now he who supplies seed to the sower and what? Bread for what? Food will also supply and increase your store of seed and and, and, and enlarge your harvest of righteousness. Watch this now. Please hear my heart. Please hear my heart. I've been in a position where we've needed every dime we had. But listen to me. Hear my heart. No one can really say, I have absolutely nothing to give. Because when we do that, we make God out to be a liar. Because he says here that he supplies seed to what? Sow. And bread to what? Eat. He says he supplies both. When a person says, I have absolutely nothing, then you probably have not been managing the seed and the bread well. Are, are you catching this? You've probably been mixing some things. Maybe, maybe you've been mis... I don't want to suggest anything bad, but maybe you've been misappropriating the seed. Now, in the corporate world, they have a word for that. It's called embezzlement. People go to jail for this stuff. God is gracious to us, okay? So, so watch this now. He says, he supplies seed to what? 
Come on, come on, come on. He supplies seed to what? So. And bread for food. You're supposed to eat the bread. You're supposed to sow the seed. Don't eat your seed. Sow the seed so that you'll have more bread the next time. If you eat the bread and the seed, what are you going to have? So now watch this now. He supplies the seed to who? The sower. What is supposed to happen with the seed? You're not supposed to walk around with a pocket full of seed. It's supposed to be What would you rather have? A pocket full of seed or a bushel of tomatoes next year? Now, if you habitually do not sow the seed, then he's not obligated to supply the seed. Because according to this promise, please catch this, he only supplies seed to those who what? Sow it. And I've noticed this through life. Now, sometimes uh, you'll go through a season where everything's drying up. Not all the time will it be traced back to this, but many times I've seen it traced back to this, where a person who at one time in their life were givers, generous, blessing people, behind everything to reach people for Jesus. And then all of a sudden, through whatever gets in their head, they stop. And it's okay, you coast for about a year. I've watched, I've been in this thing for 35 years now. You coast for about a year, and then all of a sudden, the seed supply starts drying up. Why? Because God is a wise steward. He is a great investor, and only a stupid investor would keep throwing some money into something that is not going to perpetuate itself. Right. Remember this, remember this, remember this. Last week I shared, it is not by coincidence, I do not believe, that the mark in the Old Testament of the person that belonged to God was a mark made in the place in the male's body where reproduction takes place. You take that type and shadow, you take that illustration, that symbol, and you bring it over into your finances. Our finances are supposed to reproduce, aren't they? Okay? Look, the days are gone when you put the money in the mattress. Putting money in the mattress doesn't multiply. It doesn't reproduce. Most of the bank accounts today reproduce a little bit. But you understand what I'm saying? God wants us to reproduce. God wants us to increase. God wants to why? Because there's always going to be needs. Jesus said it 2,000 years ago. The poor you'll have with you always. There's always going to be people with needs. So we're going to need to increase. We're going to need to personal increase. We're going to need to increase. We're going to need to increase in this church. Why? We've got communities to reach. God's opening up doors all the time. Are you kidding me? God's opening up the doors all the time. We're going to be reaching way more communities than just Bricktown and Bayville. So what's going to happen? Those that are in this congregation that are sowers, you're going to see more seed coming in. Why? It can't come in here unless it comes through you. We're not the Vatican. I can't write a letter to Rome and tell them, send me a couple million dollars. They won't do it anyway. It doesn't make a difference. You hear what I'm saying? So if we're going to do anything to reach our community, it's going to come through us. Turn to somebody and say, it's going to come through us. Now turn back and say, that's good news. Because that means you're going to get more seed. Now just don't, don't stuff your pocket with it. Because God will show me. <laughs> now watch. I want to wrap this up. You're, listen, I'm going to make a statement here. Just, just let it digest. Based on what I just taught, let it digest. Your future is determined by your offerings. Amen. Your future is determined by your offerings. Just, just let's think of a farmer. Again, let's go back to the most common illustration. Think of a farmer. If he has the choice to sow 10 acres or to sow 100 acres, 
And he says, by five years from now, I want to have my farm paid off. I want my house paid off. I want to be able to buy more property. I want to be able to expand my capabilities. What's he going to do? Keep planting the same 10 acres? You keep planting the same 10. Two and two is always four. I don't know if you realize that. If you don't want four, what do you got to do? You got to switch out the equation. Yes or no? Are you listening to me? You can literally put a plan together. Seek God's wisdom to put this plan together. And say, Father, this is what I want to accomplish. This is, what I, this is where I want to be in five years. This is where I want to be in 10 years. And say, Lord, I'm going to now set a plan of giving. I'm going to give X amount of dollars in addition because this is where I want to be. Because according to, and this, is what, this is how you pray. Father, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you said, if I sow sparingly, I'm going to reap sparingly. But if I sow Abundantly, I'm going to reap how? Abundantly. It's common sense. This isn't rocket science. This is common sense. You'll take those steps of faith. And look, I hope to God you're not sitting there going, oh, that's just why he just did just to give, give us, give, get us to give more money. No, go give it to somebody else. Give it to another ministry. Prove it out. But when it's right, then turn around and come back and give it over here. But seriously, prove it out. Go bless somebody. Ask God to show you to bless somebody. Ask God to show you who to, who to bless. Ask God to show you what ministry to send money to. Ask God to show you, should you be feeding the poor? Should you, should you be doing compassion? Could, should you be doing well, water wells in Africa? We support all these ministries through the church. But you do it on your own. And go see what God does. Go see what God does. Because you remember? You remember what he said to Malachi? Try me in this, says the Lord. <laughs> Try me in this. Then finally, I want you to listen to Proverbs chapter 11, starting in verse 24. And I'm going to read you this from the Passion paraphrase. Generosity brings prosperity, but withholding from charity brings poverty. Verse 25, those who live, watch this. Oh, this is the way we should be living. Those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped upon them. And one who pours out of his life to pour out blessings will be saturated, watch, watch, with what? With money? With favor. With fa- Listen to me, sweetheart. If you say, pastor, you can have money or you can have favor. Oh, give me favor. Amen. Yeah, because favor can include the finances. But favor also includes favor with God, favor with man, Amen. healing, divine health, peace of mind, stability in your family influence in the lives of others. Oh, my gosh. If I had to choose between money and favor, give me favor. Give me favor every time. Amen? And finally, don't forget the Lord Jesus, what he said himself. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. How? Good measure. Pressed, come on, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure, here it is again, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So in the tithes, God determines the blessing. God oversees, he supervises the blessing. But in the offerings, we have the capacity and the capability. And we have permission from God to decide what we're going to give. But make sure that whatever you give, you're giving it with the right heart. Don't give big amounts just because you want, oh, I want everybody to see a big amount. No, no, don't, don't do that. Don't keep it. Keep it, because if it's not done with the right heart, it's not going to benefit you anything. You remember, Jesus is sitting by the temple with his disciples in the area where the offerings were received. And a rich person came and gave a wealth of abundance, and he did it, and they're blowing trumpets and everything to make sure that everybody knew. And this, this poor little lady comes, and she puts two copper coins, and the Bible says, which equaled one penny. And Jesus says, you see this woman here? She gave more than the rich guy. He gave out of his abundance. She gave everything she had. So when you're giving, when you're giving an offering, do it with the right heart. It would be better to do a small amount with the right heart than to do a big amount with the wrong agenda. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for all that you've revealed to us, Lord God. Thank you, Father God. You've given us the capability to be like you, Father, 
to be givers, to be generous, because you are the ultimate giver. Father, you express your love by giving. And Lord, Ephesians chapter five, Lord, you told us that we're to be imitators of you, like dear children, Father. And we do. We want to be generous. We want to be givers. We want to be a blessing to everyone that's around us. We want to honor you with everything that we have, Father. It's our desire, Lord God. So I thank you for your blessing upon us. Blessings of favor. Blessings of your grace. Blessing, Father, of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can hear your heart through your spirit. Thank you for your holy word, Father, that's given us revelation into this subject, Lord. Father, Father, we're, we're finishing up this series free. We're getting free from old attitudes about money. We're getting free from the bondage of worry and concern and anxiety. And we have you to thank you for it, Father. Thank you so much, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for watching today. We pray this message has impacted and blessed you. New Beginnings Church exists to lead people into a life-changing, spirit-empowered relationship with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to support the vision here at New Beginnings, just head over to our Give page. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you soon.